Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Stefan, and today we're gonna to discuss the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. Uranus, Jupiter, and Earth will be in a nice line. This is a conjunction. It's happening on April 20th to the 21st exact, and that is the moment that a grand Earth trine forms with the Moon and also Ceres. So there's a lot of very interesting energies and archetypal symbolism baked into this. It's a very benefic and fortunate uh, planetary aspect that forms. And this conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus actually lasts for quite a while, nearly two weeks there, if we consider a one degree orb. Now this conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus happens only every 14 years. And this is the biggest transit of 2024. If we just examine it from a planetary uh, energy perspective, there could be, of course, space weather events that modify certain astrological transits, but we don't know that's gonna happen until it does. So just looking at the broad overview picture of 2024, this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction is a big deal. I made a video on it already, but I really wanna dive in depth on this Grand Earth Trine and what this means for us and some of those archetypal energies in this video. So we have Jupiter and Uranus here conjunct at 21 degrees of Taurus. We are using Western tropical astrology to understand these archetypal energies. This is based off the precession of the equinoxes. So it's not true sky position, but 21 degrees Jupiter and Uranus are meeting up uh, at the same time that this happens. We have the moon at 21 degrees. Now keep in mind the moon rotates around pretty quickly. So it's gonna sweep through Virgo and hit this trine. And Ceres is also participating in this trine. Ceres is a dwarf planet located in the asteroid belt, makes up 40% of the mass of the asteroid belt. And it's this planet that is the boundary between Mars and Jupiter. So the inner planets and the outer planets. So Ceres actually moves pretty slow. Uh, Mars has a two-year cycle. Ceres is slower than that because Jupiter is a 12-year cycle. Uranus is an 84-year cycle. The moon is like a 28-day cycle. So these two right here are in a nice, harmonious, flowing trine for a while, and then the moon comes in and hits that, activates this grand Earth trine. You have Taurus, we have fixed Earth, we have mutable uh, earth with Virgo, and we have Cardinal Earth with Capricorn all resonating and vibrating together simultaneously on April 20th and 21st. But this Jupiter Uranus conjunction itself, just those two, this very big uh, new beginning with these planets, uh, really is from April 15th to the 27th. If you look at a one degree orb, if you go out to like a three degree orb, it's even longer period of time. Uh, but then Jupiter will Jupiter will speed up and then move into Gemini in May. So this isn't uh, especially long. It's not like Jupiter is going to go forward, retrograde, and then hit it again. It's just moving past it. Boom, it's done. Now we're in air energy. So that's in May. So a uh, really big aspect here. We have a lot to go through. We're going to also talk about some of the other aspects. But just quickly, let's just go over Jupiter and Uranus and their energies. Um, so Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. Of course, the sun is the largest uh, you know, object in our solar system, making up 99.86% of the mass. But Jupiter is almost like a star. It's like on the way to becoming a star. And Jupiter in Greek mythology uh, is known as Zeus, and he is the king of the gods. He's a sky god, and he rules over Olympus. So all his brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces and all his family and other, other deities and gods, he rules over them. Uh, and there's a lot uh, of energy and kind of symbolism baked in with Zeus and Jupiter and also Uranus, because Uranus is also a sky god. He is Jupiter's grandfather. So uh, Zeus is the son of Kronos, uh, that is Saturn in the, with the Roman name. Uh, and then Uranus is the father of Saturn. So Zeus is his grandson. And there's this, this Capricornian dynamic of the son overthrowing the father uh, that you get. And we do have Capricorn present in this grander trine here with uh, Ceres 
uh, known as Demeter in Greek, myth Greek mythology. But this grand earth trine in general uh, is really focused on the earth element. You know, it's a grand earth trine, which is really associated with our material reality and also our physical well-being. It's also uh, a really strong uh, sign, like configuration for manifestation, uh, abundance, fertility. This is a very fertile Grand Earth trine. So be careful if you're trying, if you don't want any kids, be very, very careful during this time period. Like really, we're gonna dive into it precisely. Uh, and Jupiter is also connected to, uh, you know, he's very grandiose, he's very powerful. People often think of Pluto as power. Yes, Pluto is power. Jupiter is the big guy though. So he's very powerful, but he's benefic power. Uh, he works for the benefit of everyone. He tries to mediate disputes. Uh, and he is that great kind of overall, very uh, benefic, uh, helpful father figure kind of in the cosmos. So um, he's uh, benevolent, generous, uh, a little promiscuous. So, you know, he is a sky god. That's a fertility god um, <clears throat> across ancient religions. And uh, he's associated with luck and great fortune. So, Felicitas Temporum, luck of the times. That's really Jupiterian. Uh, and he's really connected to faith. Uh, like, do you trust the process? Can you keep walking your path to eventually see the success of that? So your faith, spirituality, Jupiter is connected to very strongly. His uh, home signs are Sagittarius and Pisces, very spiritual signs. And um, also uh, very wise, just big in general. So you want Jupiter on your side. If you are picking teams for the sport event on the playground, Jupiter is probably the first guy you're going to pick other than the sun. At least I would go sun and then I'd pick Jupiter personally. So uh, Uranus, though, is like a proto-Jupiter. He was uh, given birth by Gaia. Either just she self-conceived Uranus or Ether, uh, who is like the heavenly sky god, uh, made it with Gaia to give birth to Uranus. It's kind of unclear. But he is the th third largest planet in the solar system. So you have Jupiter is the largest planet, Saturn is number two, Uranus is the third largest by volume, fourth largest by mass. Neptune is a little bit more massive than Uranus. And the first sky god, created by Gaia, then mated with Gaia. He's a very fertile god. Uh, I mean, he's bringing rain to the earth, this fertility agent. You can't grow anything without water, without rain. So uh, Uranus, Gaia gave birth to uh Uranus, so Uranus could then give birth to other creations of Gaia uh, in her sphere and in her domain. Uh, he's very radical, revolutionary, liberating, expansive, also very expansive, just like Jupiter. Um, Jupiter is this plan of expansion being the biggest, but when Uranus was discovered, it expanded the solar system more than double in size. So this very expansive energy, we had the two of them coming together, combining into one, at this conjunction seed moment. So yes, we have this grand earth trine here. Really, really nice. Trines are of the, uh, the quality of Jupiter, but there also are some other energies at play. We will talk about them now and in just a little bit. We have this square here between Pluto and the sun, and the, the sun here just moved into Taurus, so that's important to recognize. And a square is of the nature of, um, uh, Mars, uh, and whereas an opposition is the nature of Saturn. So here we have Mars opposite the moon. Now keep in mind the moon moves pretty quick, so this is a pretty fast opposition, but it does occur because we have Mars at 22 degrees of Pisces. Of course, Mars being in Pisces is in the, uh, the temple, the water temple of Jupiter. So I think that kind of mellows out that flavor, but you look here at this grand earth trine, very fertile. The moon is connected to fertility. It's connected to fortune and abundance. Jupiter is connected to fortune and abundance. Uranus to fertility. Jupiter to fertility. Ceres connected to the female aspect of fertility, specifically the fertility of our planet, Earth itself. She loved to call Earth home. She wasn't in Olympus much. Uh, she was basically on the, the planet and also cycles. And so Mars here, this very masculine aspect, 
uh, likes to kind of divide things, separate, and uh, kind of sometimes can break things up, is forming this opposition here with the, the moon, but it does hit some sextiles to these points. I mean, this is also a sextile to Uranus and Jupiter, and it's also sextiling Ceres. So there is some harmonious energy there with the sextiles, which are of the nature of Venus, but we do have this quick opposition there. Then we have uh, Pluto and the Sun. Sun is the big, big, big energy of our, you know, zodiac wheel of our cosmos, our, our solar system at least, and Pluto there, the farthest out planet. So we have the inner planet and the most far planet in this tense square aspect uh, within the fixed sign. So this is kind of uh, a transformational reevaluation that's occurring. I think this is really speaking to the sun, speaks to our consciousness, our internal beliefs, and what we care for. And the Plu Pluto square here is asking us to take into consideration what we want to give birth to. What do we want to seed at this moment in time because this is an extremely fertile abundant fortunate energy so be mindful of that and don't let the mars aggression uh over overpower this beautiful benefic moment uh unlikely to happen because mars is mellowed out in pisces and actually this helps to provide some uh internal uh reorganization energies within our psyche and our subconscious we can use that mars energy favorably with that uh just it is in this opposition to the moon so be mindful of that now let's go more in depth into the archetypal energies and symbology of the moon and ceres to flush out this grand earth trine and what's at play here and let's also look at the larger kind of calendar of transits excluding mercury and excluding sextiles. This is a three degree orb. So you see a nice kind of progression here uh, with this large triangle there in orange being the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. And then we get a few more right there. So, uh, but let's start first with our text down below. Uh, and let's start with the moon. The moon symbolizes the ebb and the flow of nature. So you have this rotation of the moon constantly around the planet and it's connected to female uh, menstrual cycles, for example. There's, of course, different biologic rhythms associated with the moon. You have the tides associated with the moon. So there's different aspects of nature that have these cyclical qualities to them at that time scale of about 28 days, 14 days. It uh, depends on exactly what you look at. And the moon is connected to that. It governs and controls many of these cycles. So the moon uh, is this really nice symbol for the ebb and flow of nature at that time scale. Ceres also represents the ebb and flow of nature, but on the seasonal time scale. So there's a lot of synergy between the moon and Ceres, and they also are very similar in terms of the actual uh, astronomy. I mean, the, the moon is a small planet, a uh, dwarf planet, and Ceres is also a dwarf planet. They're not uh, exactly the same size, but it's not like the moon is the size of Jupiter and Ceres is the size of, you know, just a little speck. They're pretty similar. Um, so in Egyptian myth, the moon is Isis, and she is the mother of Horus, uh, the wife of Osiris, and a very wise sorceress. There is a, the way that Horus comes into power is that you have Ra, the original sky god, and Ra is becoming old. Ra was originally birthed at the creation of the universe. You had uh, Nun, you had pure chaos, uh, effectively like Shiva, right? Just complete nothingness. And then you had a, a, a lotus flower emerge from the pool of Nun. And inside, when it opened up, there was Ra. So Ra gave birth to the universe uh, that we know of, but he eventually became old. So Isis then went to Ra, and she tricked him into giving his power. So she learned his true name and therefore is able to uh, transfer his power over to her son, Horus, who's now the new uh, you know, ruler of the, the cosmos and Egyptian myth. So it became Horus Ra. And so that's the Egyptian myth there. She was that transfer of power from uh, the, you know, Ra, the paternal aspect, to Horus Ra, the sun. So a little bit of a different twist on that Capricornian kind of uh, archetype of father-son dynamic. You also get that with Leo. 
So she transferred that, that power to him through her cunning, very wise, very powerful sorceress. That's Assis. Now, in Greek myth, uh, she's associated with a bunch of different goddesses, more than just the Greeks too. But with Greek uh, mythology, she's associated with Artemis, who is the, the great huntress, the tamer of wild beasts. And she's also a virgin. A lot, she was extremely beautiful. A lot of different gods and deities and people looked up to Artemis and wanted to be with her. Uh, but she was able to effectively keep them at bay and keep herself um, eternally uh, virgin and untouched. And so she's very much connected to fertility as well. Uh, back in ancient Greek history, a lot of people would pray to Artemis for a uh, successful uh, childbirth or for becoming pregnant, etc. She's very fertile. She's connected to the earth. So the moon has a strong connection to the earth. Of course, it's right next to the planet. Uh, you know, Jupiter's way out there. Uranus is even further out. The moon is right next to us. It's very much associated with earth energy. Um, symbolizes the subconscious. Also is related to uh, sorcery and hidden mysteries, specifically like the dark side of the moon. There is a duality with the moon. Uh, you have one side always dark, one side that's light. And that, of course, changes as it rotates around. And that's very similar to the female cycle where we have one, we have one moment where, uh, the, the, you know, there's a ton of fertility. The egg is there. It's like conception can occur. And there's another moment, you know, in the female cycle, nothing's happy. You're not going to have a kid. There's no chance at all. Okay. Um, so you have this duality and you have, uh, this, this light side, this dark side, this, this, um, full moon, this new moon. And, this is really also connected to like our mind, like the full moon, very conscious, right? There's a lot of uh, energy uh, top of mind in the conscious, but the dark side of the moon would be the subconscious. And so the moon is connected to the subconscious. It's connected to our emotional body, how we feel, our intuition. And our subconscious is like the ocean, for example, very, very deep, very vast, very big. And our conscious is just the ripples on top just the waves that are kind of cruising along. Of course, those are important. You can have a storm. You could be a ship up there on the storm and you wish there weren't any waves, but most of the power and the energy of the mind is in the subconscious and the moon is connected to that. So it's a very strong agent in manifestation because it's really what's in your subconscious that's gonna help you manifest into material reality. You could do a lot of different manifestation rituals or certain things, but if your subconscious is flowing in a different direction because you need to format it or optimize it, it's not going to happen. So it's connected to manifestation that way. Now, like the moon, Ceres represents this ebb and flow of nature. She represents the seasons on our planet. Uh, in Greek myth, she is Demeter, the sister to Zeus. So she's not necessarily a lesser god. She is still uh, very much uh, a very powerful uh, goddess, sister to Zeus goddess of fertility so we have multiple gods and goddesses of fertility with this grand earth trine uh, usually found on earth this is happening in the earth elements of taurus virgo and capricorn and the seasons that the earth go th uh, goes through are the emotional cycles for ceres because the the myth is that her her daughter persephone was abducted by hades uh pluto brought to the underworld, and then she went into grieving, and you start to go from summer to fall and then into winter, and the earth went barren until Zeus intervened and was able to bring Persephone back to the, you know, above the overworld, you could say, for six months of the year, and then she went back down to underworld for the other six months. So you have winter when Persephone is down with Hades in the underworld, and then you have spring and summer when she's up top uh, with her mother uh, Demeter. So... It's these uh, emotional cycles for Ceres are the, the, the seasonal cycles for the Earth. So you have the Moon and Ceres very, very similar, just their, their wavelength is different. The Moon is shorter and Ceres is longer. And it's very similar with Jupiter and Uranus. Uranus has this 84-year rotation around the Sun. Jupiter is 14 years Uranus is the older sky god, Jupiter is the newer sky god, so it's very kind of fractal in nature and how things are the same but also different. Um, now if we look at our aspects here, 
First off, you'll notice this big pyramid here. That's Jupiter conjunct Uranus. This is a three degree orb. And you see that this three degree orb starts at the very beginning of April here, about the 4th of April. And then it goes all the way to about May, what would this be, about May 8th or so, May 7th. So that's a pretty tight, close uh, configuration for nearly a month long. Uh, the one degree orb, as I mentioned earlier, lasts shorter than that. Uh, but this three degree orb is still very, very significant. And so this lasts for a while. Now what's interesting about this, there's a couple things. First, you'll notice that right at the moment of this conjunction, basically right afterwards, you have that sun square Pluto. Now the sun will square Pluto uh, a few times every year. You know, it's rotating at, from our perspective, uh, one year for solar rotation but it does occur right after you get this peak uh, conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus. So it's very much built into that. And you'll also notice these flanks here. You have some energies with Mars and Venus, the inner planet surrounding this conjunction. So you have Venus conjunct Neptune, then you have Mars conjunct Saturn, and then afterwards you have Mars conjunct Neptune and Venus square Pluto. So the inner planets, both the feminine and masculine aspects are working with the uh, energies in Pisces. Uh, you know, Neptune and Saturn are both in Pisces. And then we also have Pluto and Aquarius, which Venus does the square to. We also have uh, right here, some sextiles right before the conjunction with Mars to Jupiter and Uranus. Because as we see here, Mars is conjunct Saturn and Pisces, Mars is conjunct Neptune and Pisces, so it's going to pass through that 21 degree point in between Saturn and Neptune, and it's going to form these nice sextiles with Jupiter and Uranus. We saw that in the other chart. So a lot of really nice energies that are occurring, a very fertile, abundant, fortunate time. Um, and we do have this kind of progression here. There's also a Mercury Kazemi that occurs right in this zone there. Uh, but you know, these Mercury cycles happen quite often. I wanted to exclude Mercury for this to make it a little easier to read, just so you can see it right here. That's really the big guy though, once every 14 years. Now let's look more into the, the main takeaways for this grand earth trine, Jupiter Uranus conjunction. So to summarize, the main archetypal energies and themes of this grand earth trine between Jupiter Uranus the moon and Ceres occurring on April 20th, 24 are as follows. First off, we have the earth element. This is what's taking place in. It's not taking place in fire, air, or water. It's taking place in the earth element. So this represents the material world and our physical well-being, also very much connected to manifestation, what we can manifest into our physical 3D reality. Now, this is a trine that's occurring. It's a very harmonious aspect of the nature of Jupiter. And I also have some tarot cards here. I'll show you this. So this would kind of represent a trine right here. A very nice aspect. You know, three friends all celebrating. That's a trine, very Venusian. This would be the Earth element, this overall uh, aspect, this overall conjunction and grand Earth trine is very much an ace of pentacles, like new fortune and beginning, this seed moment, this conjunction. Uh, it's a very fertile energy. This grand earth trine is very much the, the, uh, the top most kind of highest level understanding of this Jupiter Uranus conjunction that's baked into it. It occurs pretty rapidly, but that is very much the cherry on top. So it's very fertile. Uranus and Jupiter, both sky gods of male fertility. They help to bring fertility to the earth through rain and through other uh, kind of weather patterns, right? Now, uh, now we also have Ceres, the fertility goddess of the earth, and the moon represents the fertile virgin womb. So very, very fertile. It's not like we have Mars in this aspect or Pluto. We have uh, two fertile male sky gods and we have two fertile female uh, goddesses. It's also a very expansive uh, conjunction in Grand Earth Trine. Jupiter is a planet of expansion, and the discovery of Uranus greatly expanded the known size of the solar system. 
So Uranus brings in this element of unexpected but beneficial uh, growth and fortune, you could say. That's another thing, fortune. Conjunctions are these seed moments. And when you have these big planets, the outer planets, they're very powerful seed moments, both for the collective and if you have personal points in your chart or there's some specific aspect, also it can be very uh, powerful for yourself. So um, this is a very large, expansive, fortunate, abundant uh, energy that's occurring in mid-April. And uh, this one is also planted in spring in the earth element. And so the question is, what are you gonna plant during this time and uh, time will tell us what's going to bear fruit. So uh, what you invest in and what the world invests in is how this is going to bear fruit. There are certain things that are also occurring around that time of year. Um, for example, there's a Bitcoin happening on April 20th, 21st. So it's kind of coincidental occurring at the exact same time as this uh, related to money, Taurus is related to finance. That's just a little side note though. Um, so what's going to be born from this globally and for you? It's a very powerful time to plant something. All the energies are there for that. And then as we go into May, we're going to have a whole bunch of planets in Taurus. We're going to have the sun and then we're going to have some of the inner planets. And so they're going to kind of follow up and then sweep through this uh, grand conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus. So that uh, energy is going to continue. Of course, then we have Virgo season, Capricorn season. Ceres will stay in Capricorn for a while. And we also uh, eventually, you know, with the end of summer, which is Virgo season, that is a time of abundance. So you can start to perhaps look at September to get the first kind of real idea of this abundance, or maybe a little bit of a, a larger, it's really starting to manifest now in reality. Uh, during Virgo season. That'd be a good time to check that out. Virgo, of course, is connected to our physical well-being, our health, our gut health. Uh, so a really important time to focus on uh, just your surroundings, uh, making sure you can har harmonize your life, uh, taking care of yourself, your physical well-being. If you're not healthy, it's going to be hard for you to manifest abundance into your life uh, because, for example, you are what you eat and uh, you know, you are also what you think. So uh, consider these themes. I hope you found this video useful. Uh, I wanted to go more in depth on this because this Grand Earth Trine is very, very fascinating to me. It's just so beautiful. It's such a wonderful alignment of the uh, planetary energies and the archetypal energies are just really, really harmonious and flowing here. So I want to share that with you. Um, that's occurring April 20th, but the overall conjunction is lasting longer. So it's coming up soon. I wish you the best with this planetary geometry we have coming up. And if you like to watch more videos like this, then you can like the video to help this channel grow and please subscribe. I'll see you all in the next one. Have a great day. Ciao.